And now we are joined in, in the studio <laughs> with, by Ashley Horst. By, Bill, why don't you introduce Ashley? Yeah, Ashley, we've known her for years in a lot of different uh, ways. Gary was just reminding us that uh, his young kids went to, took karate. And Gary was telling the story that the first time he saw Ashley, her foot was above her head doing twisting in action. She's a very agile karate. I think you're black belt. Uh, yes, I'm a fifth degree black belt. Fifth degree black belt. So don't mess with her, John. She uh, <laughs> can be pretty tough. Then she went. Uh, then at the same time, she's working with hospice uh, and uh, in part of our fundraising with hospice, working very close with Maria Lawrence. And, and then the Stubblefield Institute did the evil of all evils in the eyes of hospice. Were able to entice. Ashley to leave hospice and come to work as executive director for the Stubblefield Institute at, Sh at Shepherd University, which she's doing a marvelous job. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. And uh, Ashley, the reason we ask you in today is uh, you've been moving ahead on a lot of fronts. COVID kind of put the Stubblefield Institute in, in a slow burn like it did a lot of folks. You Correct. became less visible or became less visible. But now we're emerging from COVID. You recently had a what they call a community engagement project that had uh, looking at the health care in the state. Talk about how that went. So. Absolutely. So we felt that the health care event was called post-pandemic health care, a discussion of growth, stress, and civility went very well. We had Dr. Clay Marsh, Dr. Alvin Moss. We had uh, Dr. Michael Laudner from the from WU Medicine, Jake Meza from Valley Health, and Charlotte Norris from the Community Partnership of African American Churches, and several others. To and Dr. McLaughlin. And Dr. McLaughlin, uh, uh, the... Colin's father, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, Mike Hassing from Shenandoah Community Health as well. And they came together and really had an interesting discussion about what it means to do health care right now and the effects of the pandemic. They discussed a loss of trust in the healthcare system and what needs to be done to reestablish that trust. We talked about the lack of civility in healthcare, that violence specifically in the emergency departments is on the rise and they're putting in more supports for our for their staff and how do they handle staff after they've experienced an episode of workplace violence. And they also talked about some of the mistakes that were made during the pandemic and how all of the practitioners were they were doing the best that they could and sometimes the information you got yesterday was not the same as the information you got today and so there were mistakes that were made and lessons that were learned and things that would be done differently next time so what's the work product from this meeting so the work product on the Stubblefield Institute's end is facilitating the conversation. It's doing a couple of things. One, it's giving a forum for people to have these important discussions in a civil, rational manner with those who have good information about it. So we're not discussing and debating hearsay on social media. The second piece is to help our community members then take that discussion out into the community and have it around their own dinner tables and with their own friends and family in a way that is civil and promotes um, informed intelligent discussion and and the intent of all these discussions is try to have it balanced first with knowledgeable people but so that both sides of an issue is represented we will never have one side having the podium and the other side being excluded so both sides and we take on in this case is a, a great example some very meaty and controversial topics were raised not only among the panelists themselves but subsequently by the questions from the audience so there were i thought it was good information sharing absolutely we did have audience members who asked about the vaccine mandates and one, whether they were still in place and expressed their opinions about that. We had audience members who asked about whether we had focused too much on just the medical side of the pandemic and whether in the planning and response to the pandemic, we had excluded the, the social services side and the, the other support 
that would have informed our responses. You know, the thing about COVID and, and that whole era, it goes beyond the medical responses and, and the social responses and mental health issues and all that. What it really came down to, I've never seen anything become, any medical issue become so politicized. And we're not talking about abortion and, you know, those, those kinds of, of politically charged issues. We're talking about people's health. And the debate was just shut down. Correct. I mean, there was no, one could not ask questions. And I, I think that was the source. I know that was the source of a lot of my anger. You know, I'll be honest with you. In fact, I, I did a blog post today about this. That, that was an era of a lot of anger for me simply because I wasn't allowed to talk. I wasn't allowed to ask questions. Yeah, I and I'm not. I was not aware of that being shut down. But you're closer to it than I am, and certainly Ash is closer to it. But let's look at it in, from hindsight, looking backward. Among the panel, we had Dr. Clay Marsh, who was the uh, the governor's representative, COVID representative that, that directed and called a lot of the shots. We had a gentleman, uh, Dr. Moss, who was very much anti-vaccine. Uh, both of them are colleagues at WVU, and they they work very well. In, they're they're good they're good friends, but they came at this from totally different sides. Uh, I don't know what it was in real time, but in after the fact, they were able to dissect their reasoning, their thinking, what went into the discussion. How long did this last? This, this panel. It's a cast of thousands. That was that was very interesting. So it was slated to last an hour and a half, and we got to the hour and a half mark, and the audience asked if we could continue the discussion. And so we pushed closer to two hours, at which point a couple of our panelists did need to leave. And so honestly, we probably could have been there till midnight and still mm -hmm. had plenty to talk about, but it. It was a great, interesting discussion. Bill, one of our very first discussions when I first started here out in the parking lot, you were telling about the, the Stubblefield Institute and the opportunity for balanced, calm, informed debate on issues. Do you find, and actually this is a question to you too, do you, do you find that um, minds get changed in, in these discussions? No, I don't think it does. We are not in, we do not do it in order to change minds. We respect individuals' opinions. They come to the opinion honestly or however they want to come to opinions. It is not our role to change minds. It is our role to prevent, uh, present very sides, uh, sides of, an, of a discussion in a civil, polite manner. And are there political folks, decision makers who are targeted to be in the audience to listen to this debate? Or is it is it strictly uh, uh, an academic exercise? No, it's not an academic exercise. It's a community exercise. Uh, we do have academicians involved. Uh, we have academicians involved on both panel and in the audience. We have our elected officials the same way. Uh, we have um, uh, individuals that are specialists in a certain field. Some of them are well known. Some of them are more politically driven, such as Donna Pazell uh, was at one of our <laughs> first meetings, uh, first discussion, and and she was against the lady uh, that was uh, 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 President Trump's communication. Uh, Mercedes Slap. Mercedes Slap, thank you. I was struggling for that. Uh, but anyway, the two of them were discussing the uh, communication at the presidential level from two different vantage points. It was very engaging, very, very interesting. But we're not there to change minds. That is correct. So honestly, most of our audience are community members. So we do get some of our local legislators who have been very engaged. A lot of times it depends on the, the topic and, of course, their availability. And we also do get community um, leaders. So, for example, with the health care discussion, there were, there were many leaders from WV Medicine and from Valley Health in the audience taking notes and hearing the, the talk of the community around them, which is really a nice opportunity for the community to engage in a discussion that may influence the leadership that can make decisions and make changes. Do people in the audience, do you often hear, I like things the way they are? 
or do people is it is the audience sort of tilted toward folks who want to, to see change how many discussions do you, have you had john that i like the, the way things are well that, no there's that, a difference that, between is, that being, is rarely stated but the, yeah, that's true right. that's true but there's a difference between who's on the panel and who's in the audience right so yeah. um as, as on any given topic as panelists go against each other i love this sort of thing i, I yeah. think that this society is much worse off than it otherwise would be if people had dinner table conversations about things that, that they disagreed with. So to have panels of experts, true experts, who well studied and, and well educated and well credentialed, take those credentials and, and come up on the different sides of the same issue, that demands respect because everybody's coming from an, from an honest place. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 the key word of what you said was discussion mm -hmm. and an open, honest discussion. And that's what we try to provide. Are these on a regular basis, like every X Monday or? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's a tremendous amount of work that's involved uh, in putting these together. A little bit of history on this is that our first few, we had them uh, uh, live performance, um, uh, live presentation, I should say, the first one or two on C-SPAN, which was, I think, was a significant coup. We've also we always record them and stream them after the fact. So, but COVID kind of, like a lot of groups, a lot of organizations, uh, gave us a body blow to the stomach. And so we had to back off. This was our one of our very first not the first, but one of our first, again, in front of a live audience. We have a couple of sectors, a couple of levels. This is, this is what we call community engagement. We have another one looking for a broader audience, American Conversation Series. The community engagement, we recently had uh, Sheriff Harmon, along with county commissioners and several others, looking at the transportation issues in the county. Uh, more of a local direction but also quite a bit of interest as well so how does an idea begin how how do you know where does a topic originate that's important enough and weighty enough to 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 warrant this kind of discussion so we have a group there our community engagement committee and they meet regularly to determine what topics they think would be of interest to others in the community and typically it's things that you're going to see people talking about on social media or you might be seeing something in the newspaper about it and so that's where it starts and we look at the different suggestions and then we start thinking about who could speak to those topics and how would we form a discussion about that and where it should take place we are um, flexible and so for example when we did one on infrastructure and growth we had that particular discussion at Musselman High School because if you know what's happening around Musselman High School it's booming growth and road congestion although now it's the land of roundabouts and so it has alleviated a little bit of that but then with this particular discussion on health care we had it at Berkeley Medical Center and that seemed to make sense and there are some that we will have at Shepherd University and so that's where that starts and we do have some flexibility in that programming and one we're looking at now and we're kind of in the formative stage is empathy empathy in the workplace empathy in the relationships empathy in government and the like so a lot of work is goes into this. One of trying to find speakers that we think that could address empathy in the true sense of the word from an empathetic uh, vantage point. Absolutely. And so that one will likely be in September. We don't have an exact date nailed down yet, but we will be bringing together someone who has been on the national stage to discuss what empathy looks like. Um, I'm not revealing his name quite yet because we're still signing on the dotted line. And we will be pairing him with a couple of other people who can talk about empathy from different directions, whether that be uh, created by the news media or how does the news media affect empathy or even from a faith base. So we think that will be an excellent panel. Man, that's a huge topic. It is. That yeah. has to be really difficult to wrangle it. And, and again, John, we're uh, 
it makes it a little bit easier on our part that we're not trying to change minds. Mm -hmm. We're trying to bring individuals in that can be, speak from both sides of an, of an issue and present in such a way that people, one, can relate to the argument but are not turned off by the anger that's embedded in the discussion. Well, if I may make a suggestion for a subtopic in here, I, I believe that empathy... I think, in general, most of what's what's wrong with society today can be tied directly to social media and and the Internet and quick access to almost data. Um, I, I think that it does, the world seems like a nastier place now, certainly less empathetic, empathic? empathetic than, than it was when I was growing up. But then again, people kept their mouths shut on these things. You know, they might not have any empathy at all. They just didn't go and announce their non-empathetic things on social media. So that's really interesting. The Stubblefield Institute recently supported a study that was done by one of our uh, faculty fellows. So uh, it's a faculty member at Shepherd University, Dr. Matt Cushion, and it was recently published in the journal New Media, and it was on how self-regulation can affect the way that we interact on social media and can affect polarization and the effects of social media on us. And through his studies, and he was working with a researcher out of SUNY Albany, Dr. Yamamoto, he, they found that the these practices of self-regulation can absolutely influence the way that we are feeling, the way that we interact with others based on our participation and how we participate in social media. One, one of our kind of interesting stories was, uh, again, COVID set us back in a lot of ways. But we had prior to COVID, immediately prior to COVID, we had a, the the um, a, best and the brightest of our local high schools, both in West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia, uh, coming together for a, a day seminar. We had Secretary of State Mac Warner came and spoke to them, and uh, it was a lot of in networking. I think about 125 students there, all, mostly seniors. They were given a project. The project was, and this was probably two weeks before COVID broke out, if we had a pandemic, and the president was asking for advice. What advice would you give to the president? This was totally un is coincidental. Wow. No idea at all that COVID is going to happen in two weeks' time. But they were addressing the problem, or this networking problem, what became the major issue of a time for the next two and a half years. So do these um, discussions, I guess, panels, but not debates, right? So th these meetings, <clears throat> excuse me, do they live on somewhere on the internet where people can go and take a look at them? Yes. So they are on our YouTube channel and th and you can search Stubblefield Institute on YouTube and it'll take you right to it. And we are currently in the process of putting together a new website. And so once that is launched, we'll, which will probably be about mid-August, they will be on our website as well. But yeah, you can go get access through Shepherd University through the Stubblefield Institute. And we have various parts of it. Some of it have been picked up with the uh, West Virginia Metro News segment of that. Uh, we also hope to do something near, uh, uh, with a gov governor debate. We, we're making great progress in having that happen. So uh, on the Republican side, we'll have the, some primary debates. And is there a mailing list people can get onto that, that want to be advise that the, the next discussion is coming up? Absolutely. We have an email list and you can access it through stubblefieldinstitute.org or you can follow us on Facebook and all of our event information is also on Facebook. And the venues where these are held, I presume that registration is required to show up. You don't just walk in the back door? Uh, we've not typically done registration. We We've discussed it, but we don't want to deter anyone from coming as well. We don't want someone to get to 10 minutes before the event and say, oh, man, I wish I'd registered. And then so I'm, I can't go. It's you are welcome to come. We are happy to have you. And I will not give the political parties involved now because it'd be inappropriate. But we're having one between two principal political folks. And uh, we got one to commit to a to the debate. His uh, his opponent would not, but we so it's going to be a one person discussion of the issues uh, without the debate structure. We found that the opponents 
uh, supporters were coming in and requesting 25 to 30 different registrations. So it was going to become an evening full of only one person on the stage, but the room full of the opponents. And once we found out what was happening, we, we stopped all advanced registration. I would think that given what you're accomplishing through the, these discussions, to bring in truly partisan folks almost kind of ruins the spirit, doesn't it? I think that if you are truly partisan, you still need to learn the the how to participate in civil discourse. And so you can come and engage in the spirit of the, dev the event. We do ask that you come with an open mind, with the intent to listen, with the intent to learn, with the intent to understand and develop empathy for where people are in their journeys. One of the things that we talk about with our students, because we have, as Bill mentioned, we also have programming for students, is I, developing an awareness of what it is that influences your political opinion. And so realizing that you and I can be presented with the exact same information and we may draw different conclusions because our lives have been different. You're male, I'm female, we're of different generations. We may have been born in different places. We have, we'll have different educational backgrounds. And so those things and so many other factors are going to change the way that we perceive an event. And so if I can understand how you arrived to your conclusion, I don't have to agree with you, but at least I understand how you got there. And it's a lot harder to dismiss someone and dismiss their opinion and ideas when you have that background and understanding of how you arrived to that point. Because then you can actually look at something and say, well, I don't agree, but it does have merit. And I can see how this would affect you in a different way than it affects me. I used to have this, um, my last big boy job was with the Trade Association, and my politics were, they, they're not far to the right, but they're certainly right of center, and which made me a unique beast in, in a trade association. And I always enjoyed the after-hours get-togethers with some of the, the most left-wing people in, in the association, and over, over a cocktail discussing whatever the issues, all the hot-button issues, and it was always calm discourse it was always respectful and and I, again minds don't get changed but it's just important to know that the people on the other side of an argument are not idiots you know they, they come from an honest place to get to the other side of the argument and to me this is one of the more refreshing and more intellectually stimulating type of discussion we can have Bonnie and I, Kobe kind of shut us down on this, but Bonnie and I have long had dinner parties that we would split the the groups down party lines, knowing fully well that we talk politics. And in fact, the argument was, not the argument, the invitation was, be prepared to discuss politics. And we had, but we had one thing in common, nobody would ever get mad. And we had some of the most enriched, engaged discussion you can imagine, with a lot of tolerance, but laying everything on the table. So it's not something we should shy away from. It's something we should encourage with one stipulation. You do it in a civil manner. Absolutely. And that's where our student programming comes in. And we are hoping to teach that to the next generation. I think this generation needs to be taught that. All right. It's 9 o'clock. Thank you so much for coming in. And Thank it's time for us to take a break.